Well, folks, once again, I'd like to welcome you all to Freedom Law School's 2006 Health and Freedom Conference. And uh, for those of you who are joining us, joining us today, I'm Paymon. I'm the president of Freedom Law School and your host for this program. And to introduce our next speaker, who's a very special one, I'd like to bring you Mr. David Von Kleist. Well, thank you. Once again, folks, I commend you all for being here and for participating in this constant and most vital search for the truth. Now, what you're going to hear today is going to be very difficult. It's not only going to be difficult for you to hear, but it's very difficult for a presenter to present this information. Now, for those of you that have seen 9-11 in plain sight, you know how shocking some of this information is, and it's very difficult to assimilate and absorb on your first sitting. You're going to experience that again when you hear what our next presenter has to share with you. Now, I've met this man over the past two years. I've spent time with him. I've met his lovely wife, and, and this man has been through it. This man... If there ever was a definition of an American hero, this man is the embodiment of that definition. This gentleman, without any concern for himself, put his own life on the line and saved hundreds and hundreds of lives on September 11th. The gentleman that I have the deepest admiration and respect for I wish him well because the path that he is on is very dangerous right now. They say that, uh, huh, what, is it, what is it that they say? <laughs> they say that well, there will come a time when telling the truth is a revolutionary act. When you hear what our, our next presenter has to say, you'll understand why that statement was made. I'm not going to take any more of his precious time. I want you to open your hearts, open your ears, open your minds, and understand what you're going to hear could very well change your perspective on what's going on in this world today. Because as I stated in my presentation yesterday, everything that we're experiencing right now in this country is predicated on the events of September 11th. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a deep honor and respect I have the privilege to bring to you a good friend and a true hero, Mr. William Rodriguez. You're very tall. You're very short. My God. Welcome. Number one, I want to say thank you to Payman for bringing me over here. I was, uh, it was very important for me to actually do this presentation. I was in uh, Venezuela uh, training the National Guard over there on uh, disaster management and uh, to meet with Mr. Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, to tell him about the truth about 9-11. And I found it very, very important to make this presentation. So we thank Payment, we thank American Free Press, who helped us uh, to come back over here, uh, and we opened 911.org, who has uh, given me the, the red light, and the green light, actually, the green light to, to do this. Um, I want to thank Telemundo. We have uh, Telemundo, a major media network, who is covering the event, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> it's not very often that you get a major media network to cover these kind of uh, presentations or events, so this is very important. This is going to be shown probably tomorrow at 11 p.m. Uh, the news uh, is called In Context, 
And if it doesn't show tomorrow because maybe another big news probably will take precedence, then it will be shown on Tuesday. Okay, so watch out for it. It's Channel 52, correct? Okay, thank you. Well, my name is William Rodriguez. I am the last survivor of the North Tower. I work at the World Trade Center for 20 years. I was just the janitor in charge of all the stairwells in the building. My duties was to clean the stairwells. And on 9-11, of course, my life totally changed. I was recognized at the White House for those efforts. Now, but I want to talk a little bit about the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Commission is a book of 576 pages and 576 pages of lies because the 9-11 Commission exists because I went with three other people to Congress to ask that we wanted a formal investigation of the events of 9-11. And you may remember that the president said, we don't need an investigation. We know who did it. That was the wrong thing to say to the families. We had the right, and we wanted to know. So we, we pressed for an investigation. They didn't want it. So we use a technique that they have used against a lot of the people uh, with the excuse of the war. We put widows. We put wives. We put fathers that love their loved ones on every television show and every news network to ask for an investigation. And they couldn't handle the emotional toll that that will create on the American public. So we got the investigation. I testified behind closed doors. They didn't want me to do the testimony in an open hearing. Everything else, everybody else, open hearings. You saw the hearings. Mine was behind closed doors. I agree because I did not know what was the process. And I thought up to that point that they were going to do the right thing. We created the Family Steering Committee and we gave the commission 168 questions to answer. We only have 22 of those questions answered. We wanted to have a family member to be part of the commission. And they say, we don't want to allow that because they will have access to national security papers and a lot of uh, fling flam and balonies. We never got it. So we have to press for questions to be answered. We never got those, those answers. Up to that point, we thought that they were going to do the right thing. The final report shows up. What a surprise. My whole testimony was omitted. It doesn't appear. 27 people that I gave them to, to uh, interrogate, they, not, they didn't call, not even one of them. Now the families are angry. They finish their report. And that's when the whole fight starts. Recognized at the White House, I was being trained for politics because they wanted to use the image. I mean, the news in New York almost every week as a leader of the families. So they saw an opportunity to have a political ally and to use the pointing the finger to the IRS, and then I went over to Hillary Clinton. I say, uh, Mrs. Clinton, uh, I'm going to make a protest in front of the federal uh, building in Lower, Ma in Lower Manhattan, and I will, I will put 5,000 people. And she said, don't do that. Don't. I said, well, what do you propose? She said, well, what about an amnesty? He said, I like the idea. So we work on something called the Tax Relief Act for Victims of Terrorism, which actually erases or eliminates the taxes for two years for any victim of terrorism. doesn't mean only World Trade Center victims, but anything that happens after 9-11. So any victim right now will have that uh, a pardon. And again, I didn't know the whole thing about the IRS. 
But anyway, we got an amnesty, which is good. And uh, became the media expert for the newspapers, Telemundo in New York. I'm the, the expert for them, CNN in Espanol. And uh, something very interesting happened. As I was pulled from the rubble, I told my story that I will tell you now. Exactly the same. The international press presented without any editing. The local press, or the national press over here, did edit it. Now, that's when I work on the legislation for getting uh, the, um, the orphans scholarship programs. And again, it was approved in record time. And uh, this is when I ask. Uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer to do an investigation of uh, the 9-11 Commission on Missions, and you, you probably heard about that. Now, let's go on to this. Let me tell you what happened. On 9-11, I wake up late. I was supposed to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. A miracle by itself, because every morning I will go and have breakfast at Windows of the World, which was a restaurant that was located on the last floor of the North Tower. So all those people that died over there were my friends. I came in at 8.30 in the morning, and I told my supervisor, I'm on the way. He said, make it, because we don't have anybody, nobody else wants to do your routine. You know what is to do 110 floors of stairs? Nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> they will do it, and they will be trembling for two days. Their knees, yeah. So, I made it, and the office was located on the B1 level. We have six sub-levels at the World Trade Center. B1, B2, all the way down to B6. Our support office was on B1. Now, Building 1, North Tower, and the South Tower connected through the basement. As I'm talking to the supervisors, Air 46, we hear, Boom! Huge explosion. It was so hard that pushed us upwards from the floor. We went up. All the walls cracked. The false ceiling completely fell down. The sprinkler system got activated. And there was screaming all over. And at that moment, I thought that it was a generator that blew up on the B2 level because we had the mechanical room with all the pumps all the uh, electrical power for the building was located in there. So it made no, not only sense, but remember, I was in the building for 20 years. I could tell the difference of something coming from the bottom and something coming from the top. So when I went to verbalize that something blew up probably in the mechanical room, we hear, pa, all the way on the top, the impact of the plane. Two different events. There was an explosion in the basement, prior to the tower being hit by a plane. Now, don't take my word for it. Anything that I'm going to tell you right now is out there. Because we said it on 9-11. Not only me, the firemen, first responders, and victims that came out of the building. Now, we hear that impact on the top and everybody started screaming. There are 14 people in general in the office. And all of a sudden, we, we, we hear a person coming like this with the hands extended saying, explosion, explosion. And when I looked at him, he has all the skin pulled from under his armpits all the way to the top of the fingertips. And he was hanging like he was a piece of glove. When you take off a glove and let it hang it, exactly like that. I thought it was clothing. When I realized it was his skin, when I finally look at his face, he got missing parts on his face. I said, what happened? He was in shock. He said, the elevators. I said, I, I don't understand. So I went to pick up, don't move. I went to pick up the phone to call the uh, EMS unit that was located on the South Tower. And when I go to pick up the phone, another explosion on the top. And the walls cracked more. And everything started to, to shake. So I said, we got to get out. we got to get out. I took the, the guy. It was a black guy named Felipe David. That's Felipe. 
and I let everybody out. As I, we went out through the loading dock. We get outside. There's an ambulance coming over. We stop the ambulance. I put Mr. Felipe David, a, a guy from uh, uh, Bolivia, who was on the B2 level. He was in charge of filling up the machines with water in the building, the vending machines, and with uh, sodas. And as uh, he was in his room, in his closet, he said there was fire, and he put his hands to cover his face because of the huge, like, uh, huge explosion. And that's how he made it. And he tried to make it through the elevator, and he couldn't make it. So he went up the stairwells, one flight up, and that's how he went to my, to my office. So I took him out, put him in the ambulance. He goes into a coma in the ambulance. There's one I hear for the first time. A plane hit the building. A plane hit the building. A security guard was standing right next to me with a radio. And that's when I look up for the first time and I see the, the hole, the debris coming down, the fire. But from the angle of vision that I had, because I was right at the corner of the base of the building, you couldn't see the, the antenna. So I went crazy. I said, we got to go up. Because I thought right away of the people from Windows of the World. He said, we got to go up. We got to go up. And those 14 people that I took out, they started, no, you stay here. My supervisor, a guy three times my, my size, weightlifter, he was like, Rodriguez, you're not going in there. You stay here. He said, no, we're going in. No, you stay here. So I took the radio from the security guard, who I knew, and I ran inside the building through the loading dock, down the hill, went inside, and there was water all over. Now, water all over on the basement. How come there wasn't water on the top floors? Again, an explosion on the basement. Now, I get to the South Tower because after the 1993 bombing, they created something called the OCC of the Operation Control Center on the South Tower. They spent $153 million to retrofit the building. And uh, so I wanted to tell them that I had a person that was wounded outside the building. So when I get there, there's nobody in the office. I'm hitting the bulletproof window. Nobody answers. I found a guy called Jimmy Barrett that worked for the maintenance company who was on the lower basement from the south tower who did not know what was going on. He was like, what's happening? And I told him what, what I heard and what I heard on the radio. And he couldn't believe it. So that gives you a, an idea of how many people probably died on the sub-levels without knowing ever what was going on. Now, I tell him, you've got to get out. There was a lady at the entrance to the Marriott Hotel on the basement that heard the whole thing but did not dare to leave her post because she was a new worker and she was afraid that she was going to be fired. I said, you've got to get out now. I said, no, 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 I'm new, I'm new. Get out now. There's nobody here. As I left the South Tower, I ran again towards the North Tower. When I get to the North Tower, you know how the uh, freight elevators are? That it has, uh, it's not a regular roof, it's just a mesh. That's exactly because all the water was going very easily in. So I said, God, please help me. I was not a spiritual person. I was not. And at that moment, I found in an area that was supposed to be clean of any construction debris, a huge metal pipe. I took that pipe, put it against the door, forced the door open, and uh, when it opened up, the door is open this way, because it's a freight elevator. Ambient music. There you go. <laughs> when the doors open, I'm sorry. When the doors open, the bottom door, when it gets to the bottom, makes all the water on my side to rush in. It's empty by itself because the elevator is down. When I pick down, I see way below these two people standing on a, on a wood log with water up to here. I said, oh my God. What is this? I'm still not comprehending what's going on. And I said, 
God, help me. Again. Because they're screaming, help, 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 and looking up. You see these eyes practically coming out of their faces. And uh, I didn't know how to get down there. So when I said, God, please help me, I remember right away that in the area where they have the trash compactors, the electricians always had ladders. But they always tie them up with chains so people will not steal them. Because it was easy to come inside the loading dock with the truck, put a ladder inside, and take it. So they always tie them up with chains. So I said, let me find one. Please, let me find one. And I ran there. And the incredible thing is that the only one that was not chained was the longest one of all the ladders. An 18 feet long ladder which I took, aluminum ladder, I took it, dropped it inside the elevator shaft, went inside, opened the, 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 the grid, got them both out, took them outside the building, put them in an ambulance, and went back inside the building again through the loading dock running. Because my concern again was how to help the people of Windows of the World. And I'm like, my friends, my God, my friends, and I'm screaming, we got to go back in. Nobody wanted to go in. So I said, I'm going again. So I went in, and I found police officer David Lim from the Port Authority Police. He was in charge of the K-9 unit. He meets me there. He said, Willie. And he stays quiet. I said, what's going on? He said, I don't know. He said, do you have the key? I said, yes. He meant, did I have the key, the master key? There were only five master keys in the building. The people with the other four were trained on egress, escape, rescue efforts, and they were the first one to run out. Yeah. I was just a janitor. And the reason that I had that key was because I sued the Port Authority in 1997, because I fell down the stairwells and they couldn't find me for like three hours. And I won the arbitration and they had to give me the key. And that key opened the whole complex. So, of course, the Port Authority police knew because it was a high security level key that I had it. So I said, let's go. We get to the lobby. Now, all the firemen are there waiting with something called the fire access key, which is a key that they put in any elevator, and if the elevator is up, we'll go down. If it's down, it will go up to pick them up. So, they're there waiting for the elevator. I said, forget about the elevator. There's no elevator. Follow me. I know the best way, and I have the key to the stairwells. Follow me. So, this whole unit, Ladder 6, follows me as we start going up the stairwells. Now, it was so difficult because these poor people, talking about the firemen, they have so much equipment in their back. We're talking about 70 to 150 pounds of equipment between machines to open doors, machines to break things, you know. It was so hard to go up because people were coming down and kept bumping into, into us. The stairwells were we only had three stairwells, A, B, and C. B was the longest one of them. And uh, as we make it over there to the third floor, we have to stop and regroup because it was so difficult. So I said, let's go by the A staircase, which was the one that faced the area that the building was hit by the, by the plane. So we start going up, and now we start the Odyssey. We have to go and open Every single door. Now, I'm going to tell you why. The World Trade Center was a Class A building. For anybody in construction here, will understand that Class A building means that three doors, one open, one will open. Three won't open, one will open all the way to the top. The reason they do that is because it's a skyscraper over, uh, I think, uh, 27 floors high. They have to have that safety 
to encapsulate a, fi a fire, because otherwise a fire will consume a building going up, the, the fire. So they do that. They will sacrifice maybe a floor or two, but everybody else will be saved. So that's why opening those doors was crucial. I want to show you the... These are the stairwells. It's not big. Look at that. No re-entry. Next re-entry, 43 and 39 floor. Huh. The problem was that the World Trade Center was such a tall building, a city within a city, that a lot of people, the turnaround was constant. People getting fired, people getting hired, people retiring. It was a constant. So, a lot of people didn't even know where the exits were. They made drills only two times a year. They should have had mandatory drills so people will know every time that they will go to work for the first time where to escape. They didn't have that. That's one of the recommendations that we made to the uh, National Institute on uh, Safety and Technology. Now, we start going up and it was so hard because these poor people couldn't continue at the same pace as I was going. I had no equipment in my back. I have no uh, fireproof clothing that made it difficult. I had just my uniform, and I did the stairwells every single day. So physically, at that time, at that time, <laughs> at that time, I was very skinny. Very, very skinny. Um, I was sometimes two or three floors above the fire department, opening doors, going in the offices, screaming for people to follow my voice, letting people out. As I went up, we heard explosions on the third zone. The third zone is from 44 to 1. You have one uh, 110 to 78, 78 to 44, 44 to 1. The building was dif divided that way. When I asked, what, is those, what are those explosions? And he said, oh, maybe the gas tanks in the kitchens. It was a class A building. Only electrical kitchens are allowed. All right? The smell was horrible, was putrid, was... Uh, Imagine uh, ammonia and sulfur getting stuck in your throat. That's exactly how we smell over there. And uh shocking moment was that a person comes down and says, we have a person on a wheelchair on the 27th floor that cannot breathe. I go down two f flights uh, below and I tell the fire department, they told me that they have a person on a wheelchair what can we do? And he said, don't worry, we, we, we'll make it there. And uh, he explained, we always leave the handicaps for the last. So they, they didn't have power. They just took their jackets, their equipment, they dropped it on the floor. And I remember that some of them even took their boots and they laid down. And it was so sad just to see that. And David Lim tells me, the police officer, Willie, do you know this floor? I say, yeah. I say, where can we get water? He said, well, there's a machine a vending machine on the other side. So let's go. He breaks the machine. We start taking the water, putting them in trash cans. And we distribute them to the firemen. I get the opportunity, because there was power in there, to pick up a phone and call my mother. I wanted to call my mother in Puerto Rico to let her know that I was okay in case she heard something. Did I, did I know, little did I know, was that everybody knew what was happening but us. She picked up the phone and said, what are you doing? Get out of there. She said, mom, I'm okay. Nothing has happened to me. There's an accident here. And I'm helping the fire department. He said, that's not your job. Get out. <laughs> say, ma, I have the key. These people don't know what they're doing. They don't know the building. Because there was total disorientation. Everybody was doing what was, what was going on. Chain of command over there didn't work. So I said, don't worry. I call you later. I'm not going to make it to the fire. I'm just going to take them to a certain point, 
and I'm coming down, but I cannot give them the key. So, hang up the phone. On the radio, I have my supervisor, Rodriguez, William Rodriguez, abandon the building right now. I continue, since they stay there, I continue going floor by floor, opening, letting people out, until I stop on the 33rd floor. Why the 33rd floor? Because on the 33rd floor, I had a closet with all the supplies. Every 16th floor, I had a little cubicle to put stuff for the, for the, for the stairwells. And there I have like the paper mask that I use for the cleaning. So I wanted to give those paper masks to the people coming down the stairwell. Now, Mind you, the people that is coming down, some of them are caught in their face because they're sitting in front of the offices with a window. Some of them are joking because they're nervous. But that hysterical thing that everybody talks about, that never happened. I guess everybody was in shock because nobody expected this. And we didn't know what was going on. So I continue going up and get to the 33rd floor. I find a lady trembling on the floor on a fetal position. She had no shoes. I said, what are you doing there? And she said, I don't know where to go. I stood her up, put her on the stairwell. There were a couple of people coming down. I remember people from the cafeteria of the 44th floor. And I say, take her out. And at that moment, on the corridor, I hear something very strange. On the 34th floor, I hear stuff being moved around. And heavy stuff. You know, like those uh, metal dumpsters scratching the floor. Really heavy stuff. Now, why was it strange? Because the 34th floor was a floor that was got out by the construction uh, crew of the World Trade Center, and it was closed. In other words, elevators did not stop there. There was no walls. There's nothing there. And for those people that, you know, maybe are not in construction, that's what a building does. When a tenant moves out, they got it out, and they make the money redesigning the place to the specification of the new tenant. So to hear this is the first time that I felt fear on that day. So, of course, I knew somebody was there. So I bypassed that floor and continued to the upper floors. People screaming. People, to this day, I guess the biggest pain and nightmare that I will have just to hear the screams of people still stuck in the elevator claiming for help. So, I make it to the 39th floor. On the 39th floor, from the opposite side of the stairwell, comes David Lim with two far sheaf, because they have the white shirts, and we all gather together to talk about what we were going to do next. And at that moment, BAM! We hear the impact of the other tower. And inside of the building, we hear, boom, 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 boom. And on the radio, we hear, we lost 65, we lost 65. Meaning the 65th floor collapsed floor by floor by floor up to the 44th floor. We're on the 39th floor. Five flights away. And I... Go into a frenzy. We gotta go up. We gotta go up. We gotta go up. And, 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 and David Lim said, Willie, no. You've done enough, but this is not your job. My mother again. <laughs> and I say, what? No, I'm going up. He said, you're still a civilian. You're my responsibility. Better if you give me a hand with a person on the wheelchair on the 27th floor and get out. He said, you know, I'm going up. He said, Please, Willie, just give me that, do, do me that favor. So I get, I said, you know, I'm going to do it, but I'm coming right back. I ran down to the 27th floor. I screamed to the fireman. I said, I have orders to get this guy down right now. 
The guy was already taken out from the wheelchair, put on a rescue basket, an orange basket, and tied up. And three firemen stood up, said, let's go. So we started bringing him down the stairwell. As we go down, we continue listening to small explosions in the building. And all of a sudden, chunks of the ceiling, of the wall, are coming all over us. But it was shiprock. And one of the, uh, the, the things that I never forget, it was the building was shifting constantly. So the fluorescent light, the holders changed position. And you could hear the lights breaking in, in line all the way down. Pa, 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 pa. So we're like, oh my God, what is this? All of a sudden we hear a huge thump. South Tower collapse. While we're going down the stairwell, we lost uh, balance. We fell. I remember the guy on the, uh, the, uh, uh, on the rescue basket, because he had one of those masks, looked at us and I said, Don't worry. After this, we're going to go get a beer. And he looks at me and goes like this. <laughs> and I don't drink. <laughs> I don't drink. We make it to the lobby. When we get to the lobby, that beautiful marble. How many people have ever been to, been to the World Trade Center? Remember that marble that was on the, on the lobby? Everything was pulled from the wall. And the only thing you saw was the cement patches where the marble was before. So, I said, oh God, what is this? A Dantesque zine. I looked to the left. Everything was collapsed. The doors of the freight elevators and the passengers' elevators on the lobby were open this way. Meaning something happened from the bottom and kicked the doors open from the bottom up like this. I said, again, God, what's going on? One of the firemen, his name was Regenhard. Looks at me and said, set up the ambulance. So I turn to the right and go to the West Side Avenue entrance, which was the main entrance to the building. As I go closer, every glass from the area was totally destroyed. There was glass shattered everywhere. Look to the left, the uh, uh, fire safety director uh, area was totally collapsed. And... Uh, I'm in shock again. I get to the front where the cubicle, not the cubicle, the revolving door was. There was no revolving door, just the empty space. I get to the front, right on top of me. And you could hear the, the whole thing coming down. Boom, boom, boom. And the truck practically getting squashed. I, I was centimeters from uh, the muffler. I could see the heat, I, I, the, the vapor and everything. And all I remember I said at that moment was, God, please don't give my mother the pain to see my body in pieces. Just let her find my body and recognize it. Because what I saw, all the bodies that I saw, and that's the only thing I asked for. And I knew I was going to die. And I expected death. And as I was there, all of a sudden, this dust came from every orifice under the truck and burns my face burn my leg on my thigh I, have a, I still have the scar my knee was open I don't know how totally open and now I know I'm not dying squash but I'm going to die of asphyxia because I cannot breathe and I put my face under my I put my shirt right under and I said I'm going to die I'm just going to wait death as much as I can. I was a magician for 30 years. And uh, I used to do the escape, uh, the, the escape tricks that every magician does. The, escape, the, the straight jacket escape and everything. So, you know, we always thought that you have to relax. You have to contain your breathing. And that's what I was trying to do. Locally, CNN and Global Vision from Brazil were filming from the World Financial Center side, and they said the last person came out right there. And they pointed the area 
where the rescue effort started. And that's how I was saved that day. Now, they put me out in the middle of the room. That dust did not disperse for hours. That cloud. And I remember when they pulled me from under, the only thing I could see was the fluorescent lights on the jackets of the firemen. And a flashlight and a guy screaming this way, this way. And then I saw the word ambulance backwards. And I went in, stayed there for, a, for, for, for oxygen for like 15 minutes, came out. This is at the perimeter of ground zero. Get out. And the first thing I do is run back to where the truck was to make sure there was nobody else. When I get there, I was taken out on the nick of time because the tires blew up and the truck completely collapsed. So it was, it was a mission. And uh, I remember looking through the rubble. Remember that bridge that connected the World Financial Center with the World Trade Center? That collapsed on top of uh, several fire trucks. I went under. I found... Uh, a, a Two boots. I pulled the boots and I stayed with one leg inside. And uh, that's when I said I cannot continue doing this. And, but I stayed in the area until CNN called me, come over here. And I went over there and I thought, well, my mother probably thinks that I died. Somebody will be able to see me and let her know. So see, I went over there and I told CNN totally... Uh, in shock. You know, I lost all my friends. The Port Authority police officer that was with me, they believe, died. Everybody died. The person on the wheelchair. The whole story, how I heard an explosion. How was explosions in the building. That went live on national TV all over the world. So what I'm telling you right now is nothing new. It's been out there. And after that, I became, of course, because of the media attention, I said, what I do with this? So I said, let's use it to organize the families. And that's why I started fighting for benefits and so on. Now, the good part was that, you see, these people, Felipe David, came out out of coma 13 weeks after. Remember, I did not know these people personally. He sees me on, on NBC talking about uh, the problems with the Red Cross, not giving money to the uh, victims and, and so on. And he sees me and calls the doctor. He said, that's the guy that saved me. So NBC does a, a reunion on television. And it was very emotional. Felipe de, de, David, his testimony was never heard by the commission. And he was there. Salvatore Giambanco. That's uh, uh, TBN, the Christian Network. Doing the encounter on Ground Zero. Sees me on TV, the same thing. That's the guy that saved me. Testimony never heard by the commission either. David Lim survived under the rubble. He was made sergeant after that. He lost his dog. And this is the encounter for Telemundo in New York. So, my story started to be validated constantly within months by all these people that were there. And the reason we do this is that we need the truth. We need to find out when you have Richard Clark coming on national TV and saying, we fail you. We lied to you. Our president fell you. Our government fell you. And you have Condoleezza Rice refusing to testify for the commission. It made it more important to find out the truth. And that's why we do this. We owe this to the victims. I lost 200 friends. 200 friends i never going to see again. You know the emotional inventory that you have to go daily. It's like your whole family is wiped out. 
So I have to be the voice for those people that don't have the opportunity to talk for themselves, to claim for justice. And that's why I'm going all over the world. Because if here they don't want to listen, they're listening out there. And they're doing the right thing out there. I want to thank all of you for this opportunity. All we ask is that continue asking questions. The families, the victims, and the survivors believe, and rightly so, because we have been through the whole process of the investigation, that we have been lied to. That they have used our tragedy for a political agenda that we do not agree with. That we have been used to lose our little civil rights that we have left. That movement from the 60s that fought so hard to give us rights is gone. The Patriot Act, one single act. This administration has taken all those rights like that. Congress, Senate, legislature. They're all into it. So we have to fight back. We have to get our rights back because every time that something happens, when you are more passive and tranquil, you will hear on the news, red alert, orange alert. They got to keep you constantly unsecure. They have to control you. They have to control you. They put people on different television programs. Oh, it's okay that they check my bags and check my phone and if I have nothing to hide and I'm going to feel more secure, I have to give my right to do that to feel more secure. It's okay. What? That doesn't make any sense. 